This is Jonathan Ferguson, the keeper of firearms and artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this week's episode, he's taking a look at the World War II era weaponry of Sniper Elite 5, a franchise that he's actually consulted on before. Right, the SRAM. Whatever the details, uh, it's really nice to see this gun in the game and go, I helped with that. <laughs> If you're a fan of Jonathan, then make sure to check out the series playlist in the description of this video. And if there are any other games, guns, or mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comments section below. Right, let's check out the weapons of Sniper Elite 5. So this, this is a franchise that I've actually worked on with the guys at Rebellion. It was a great experience, I have to say. Not directly on this game, uh, on the previous game, and then uh, a bit of follow-up work effectively between the two. So there are, I'm, I'm going to be looking out for stuff that I may have influenced or I may have missed <laughs> or has sort of crept in since. One of the big things I'm going to have to talk about is, well, weapon modifications. So starting here with the silencer or suppressor on this 1903 Springfield. I have one here, our only one with a um, period scope on it actually. Different setup to what's in the game there. This is the M73B type scope, very, very slim. That I'm pretty sure was modeled previously. We've got a different model here. I don't immediately recognize uh, as ever answers in the, in the comments, uh, but we have a fairly limited selection of US sniping kit. The, the texturing looks really nice in terms of the, the the sheen, the shine, the dings, the scrapes, uh, the lighting, all of that. Some nice beauty shots that Dave has <laughs> recorded for me there. I was actually looking to see if it was uh, photography referenced from this very object, but I don't think it was. I think they've got that from somewhere else. Probably already had it when they came to us. Manipulations, that was something that Rebellion were particularly interested in when they came to us at the Royal Armouries, was what's a period correct position. Uh, we looked up period manuals for that. Uh, we did some reference for them, and I know they've got some from elsewhere as well. The very slick bolt manipulation that Carl's doing on the 1903 there with finger and thumb, that's exactly how it was taught in the British Army. Now, he is an American, but uh, voiced by a Canadian, I think. But he is supposed to be your SOE, so it made sense to us he would follow British drill to some extent with some artistic license. Anyway, suppressors. So, yeah, obviously not one on this. They're not really a thing. We do have a the Enfield 303 with a Maxim pattern silencer, and he did call this a silencer, on it. So they were a thing. So it's, this is one of these plausible things you could have if someone was really into their technology, had all the connections necessary to get, to get that tech and make use of it. However, as far as I know, it was not done by snipers in the Second World War. The design of the suppressors, I could be missing something here, but I, I have, this is the first one I've had a good look at from this game, and it's a really funky shape. The reason silencers are cylindrical, typically, some modern ones have broken away from that, but they still have a, a large cross section. You need volume for the, for the hot gases to expand into for the silencer to do its job. This shape, I don't know, it looks, it's, it looks like some other type of muzzle device more so than a silencer. There's not a great deal of volume in there. And of course, the other thing is, which I know Rebellion know about, is high pressure cartridges like rifle cartridges. There's only so, there's only so much you can do to suppress those. Now, major feature of the Sniper Elite games is the Wellrod pistol. Now, what Rebellion have depicted here, as you can see from this one that I'm waving around here, the actual 9mm Mark I well rod is significantly longer than depicted in the game. It's got the chunkiness, correct, the trigger guard that's not on the original, 32 caliber guns. Most of the details are, are correct. It's not long enough. Now, I raised this with Sniper Elite 4 and they told me that due to the, the interchangeable nature of the sidearms, not everyone's going to run around with a, with a well rod. The way the holstering system works, Got, you can't take it over a certain length. So that's why this is a bit of a hybrid design. This uh, large diameter and, and great overall length is what makes this thing so very quiet. That also results in the front sight being in a different relative position on the barrel than the version that's modeled in the game. 
Uh, however, I do know they did make improvements to the well rod, so let's see it in action. Quick pause there just to say that the, the subsonic ammunition in this and the game absolutely understands the basics of sound suppression and that if you want to eliminate one of the loudest noises from a gun, the supersonic crack, then you need subsonic ammunition. It doesn't break the sound barrier and doesn't give you that supersonic crack. They've built that into the game to give you variety in your ammunition. Uh, the design they've chosen is distinctively different than a normal, normal round for gameplay reasons uh, or for visualization reasons in the in the menu. It's not the case. Subsonic ammunition might be marked as such with a, with a colored tip or something. Not usually, it's usually just the same brass color of the copper jacket or whatever as whatever normal ammunition they're using. So this kind of green with a green separate jacket bit looks nice. Um, I'm not aware of a precedent for that. Right, so uh, manipulation of this is good. He's developed some sort of a technique like this. There's no set drill for, for how to operate this thing. Uh, with the bolt extended, which comes a bit too far out, <laughs> uh, it should go this far out. It does have the two locking lugs depicted, which is a, a detail that you wouldn't necessarily expect them to pick up on. But of course, they have been in here and looked at our stuff. So. How it's operated is good. Sound effects, all great. Those shots, um, not subsonic. And frankly, it's very subjective, different sound systems, all of that, but it sounds like it ought to. But I suppose I would say that, <laughs> having, having helped on this. Right, so we're getting some kills at some pretty extreme ranges for a pistol here. Now, that last one, 51 meters, okay. And Carl is prone. He's an expert marksman. So it's a kind of extreme range. I, you know, for, I'd say for any hand, any handgun in an actual fighting context, not that I've done it myself, probably about 50 meters is your absolute effective maximum. But hey, if you're effectively sniping with the thing like he is, very hard to say. I'm sure some of you have seen uh, Hickok 45 dinging gongs at 400 yards with his Glock. Anything's possible with the right amount of training skill and all of that. So I'm not gonna comment on that too far. So I've heard the difference now between the subsonic and the, and the normal ammunition. It's very hard to sort of quantify that. It's probably the difference between a fresh well rod and a worn out well rod. It's still suppressing, you know, pretty well, but it's audibly louder. And that's kind of the difference we're hearing here. So another way to go would have been to have had the well rod as a semi-perishable weapon. And through the course of a long level like, like these, the thing would wear out and get louder. And so you'd be in more danger of being heard the more you used it, which would encourage you to keep it in reserve. Now, that's not something I thought of when, when I was working uh, or advising on this game. It's a different, another way to go, but of course that wouldn't fit with all of the other weapons in the game. You need systems that apply across the board, each weapon with its own equivalent modifications, its own different mo uh, ammunition types and so on. So if you, if you excluded the well rod from having subsonic ammo or something, that wouldn't really work. The well gun is one of two that we have. The other one's missing the stock. Thankfully, um, they must have looked at the right one uh, when they were here. So this is a, an SOE alternative to the Sten gun, or at least that was the intention. As far as we know, these did not see actual service, but it's completely plausibly deniable for a game like this, as far as I'm concerned, or I wouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> It's just really nice to see it in the game. It's something different that, that fits the whole setup. You can very clearly see this open receiver design and the bolt sliding back and forth. So it really is um, special operations executives take on a, on a relatively cheap submachine gun, but they wanted something more compact and the step. The folding stock, now Carl's keeping it on his back with the stock uh, unfolded the whole time. I think that probably is what you would do if you were trying to carry two primary weapons effectively like that. The way it folds is there's a, there's a latch there and you pull out and fold the butt plate, you finagle it. That butt plate slips into there and it shuts. And in the 
thumbnail, that's what it looks like. The little icon thumbnail indicator for the weapon is the stock folded across the top. So it's a top folding stock, Sten gun magazine, so they didn't address the main issue of the Sten design. So yeah, that's, that's the well gun. It's shorter, stumpier, more compact, but it is capability wise, it's no different than a Sten. I always find it uh, a little bit intriguing to see gameplay or playing myself where you find that squeezing off single shots with an automatic weapon is quite effective in the game. To me, that's an indicator of a quote unquote realistic game. So those shots there, single shots at, at middle distance that are having a good effect. That's what we would expect to see. Accurate semi-automatic shots, and then only at close range would you switch to automatic, at which point you'll be firing from the hip, which is something I've always appreciated this series for in terms of how it depicts hip fire as being not massively accurate, but devastating at close range. That's what it was for, the assault position, what we called it in Britain, Commonwealth, versus uh, deliberate aim from the shoulder, and you feel like you're using a bit of skill to have an, have an effect. Right, so one of the one of the features added here, uh, well, subsonic ammunition makes sense with in in tandem with suppressors. Subsonic ammunition on its own would still make a certain amount of sense. The ranges that a sniper is engaging at, i.e., hundred yards plus, eliminating that crack would go some way toward concealing your, where that shot came from. This deserves a bit of praise, I think, because this 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 is. Um, Classic case of compromise between nerdy conversations with the likes of me and trying to make a game that actually is fun to play. Most games simply, you, know, you have a silencer, your bullets immediately lose damage for absolutely no reason. There's, there's no reason for bullets to automatically lose damage unless they're being fired out of an integrally suppressed design that is bleeding off repellent gases and dropping the uh, velocity and therefore the damage, which is where that semi-myth comes from. So rather than fall into that trap, they have come up with suppressors and subsonic ammo, and it's just that they're letting you use that ammo on its own without a suppressed weapon. I think it's an interesting thing for players to experiment with, to be honest. Uh, the cruel irony, given the uh, emotional support stronger there of <laughs> showing me an SDG44 tricked out, albeit not too much. Um, I understand that games require customization now, and those of us who are curmudgeonly can simply ignore that and, and lose out by not fitting them. <laughs> We've got a, a muzzle break, I think, on this, which is not not a period thing as far as I'm aware. None of ours certainly have that, but it looks period appropriate. I, I'm much more accommodating of accessories on, on guns and games if they at least look like they're right, period. And the night sight looks right technology-wise. It looks too compact though. If you look at night sights, even as late as the early, early 80s, 70s, early 80s, they were huge, <laughs> absolutely immense with a huge lamp to illuminate it with invisible light, effectively, what you're aiming at, and then the, the tube to actually pick that up and have a crosshair and all of that. So I guess this is meant to be a sort of secret advancement on the German vampire night sight. So I, I, yeah, I get why it's on there. Um, I can't fully get on board with it. <laughs> Let's see how it works. Now, I, we don't have, well, we don't have any of these sort of first generation night sights that we can power up, but my understanding, and I've seen the odd bit of footage, this is far too sharp an image for a first generation night sight. They were kind of a green blur <laughs> and only really any good, I wouldn't like to say, but maybe 50, 50 yards, 50 meters, something like that. But the frustration factor for a player of having to deal with that, you just wouldn't bother. You'd probably turn up the brightness on your monitor or whatever, uh, rather than use it. So it has to be attractive to the player to use. Right, this is, this is where the weapon customization chickens come home to roost, I think, is you're giving people tools at the end of the day. 
<laughs> you're giving them options. And so rather than something like this, which is a very nice period Luger pistol carbine with the, the little Georg Luger mark on the back there. Instead of that, you end up with a bit of a Frankenstein's monster with a Luger pistol with a, a somehow extended barrel. It's quite very hard to extend barrels by sort of just attaching bits. So you could do this, <laughs> but you wouldn't. There is sort of a tactical niche for a pistol type carbine. But I think in this case, you'd be just lugging around something that's a bit too heavy and complicated for no real reason when you'd either be drawing a, a, a sidearm or using your sniper rifle. But it's, it is surprising what you can do with a stock pistol, with a scope, this obviously doesn't have the scope, at sort of, you know, 100 meters, 200 meters, you can, you can lob shots in very accurately with that. So kind of makes sense as a sniper's preferred backup weapon, if you like, if he had unlimited resources like Q department from James Bond, which of course he sort of does because he's got uh, Station 9 um, SOE. So effectively, when you modify a gun in this game, you are you are being Station 9, but in Carl's brain, instead of back in Blighty <laughs> and having to wait six months to a year to get that product developed and in the hands of, a, of an operative, you're able to just do it on the spot. Right, the SREM. This is the result of Rebellion coming back to us after our work on Sniper Elite 4 and asking, and at the time they were thinking DLC, what have you got that's really wacky but just about plausible? That's the, that's the secret, isn't it? With a, with a game like this, could, there, could this thing have existed in that theater at that time and be in his hands? And so I could not resist including this in my uh, short list of suggestions. And although the DLC didn't transpire, the SRAM is now in Sniper Elite 5. First ever appearance for this very unusual rifle. Now it says in the description text, it says developed for special ops by British SOE. This is actually not an SOE design. And it was designed by, I think these guys deserve some credit, although I don't have a single name designer for this, unfortunately, but it was developed by the Czech section. And this is what they came up with. So it wasn't for special operations type work. It was a conceptual alternative to the self-loading rifle, if that makes any sense to you. And it probably doesn't because looking back, it's a bit quick. But this whole pump cocking arrangement where you press uh, the trigger that's not a trigger and you pull back the, the pump grip, the, the, the pistol grip, like it's a shotgun pump and it pulls the bolt down a ramp. I'll explain that in a moment. And then you push forward to chamber around. That was all about trying not to disturb your, your position and hold as a sniper, as an alternative to semi-automatic fire. Now to us today, that sounds a bit bonkers, but at the time, not, you know, not everyone was sure that something like an M1 Garin was the way to go. They commissioned in 1944, um, 20 prototypes, only two were ever made. We've got this one. I'm guessing Carl has left the other one in Northern France somewhere. So ours is not complete. It's missing the front scope ring for reasons unknown. Uh, we've got some difference here. Um, the rifle seems to have the very fore end of a number four. So it's not a perfect replica of our only surviving SREM. They have taken the liberty of making the front end basically that of the number four. Bigger sight protectors, uh, wooden, wooden forend all the way to that point there, and then the barrel sort of floated within the woodwork like a number four. Uh, that must be a deliberate deliberate design choice. Maybe in this universe, they have taken this concept a little bit further. Well, they must have done, because it's out in the field, and they've gone with, with that to protect the, the barrel. I, I'm not sure. Whatever the details, uh, it's really nice to see this gun in the game and go, I helped with that. <laughs> The Thompson. We've got to have a Thompson in a Second World War game, I think. I think everyone would mutiny, me included, if it wasn't included. Now, I'm pretty sure I showed the guys from Rebellion this when they came to see us um, on one occasion. This is an SOE modified silenced Thompson gun. And I think is probably the, the it's not necessarily the basis 
for the suppressor mod here, but it is a little similar. The, the, the way the suppressor is partially over the barrel is the case here, but the suppressor design is completely different. They've gone for something much more angular and unusual looking. Uh, personally, I'd have stuck with that, but that's, that's just me. Yeah, what are you going to do? You, you replicate the Thompson as best you can, and then you give people the option to change it up. So now something that is immediately kind of triggering my uh, pedantry is the, the drum mag, because the drum mag for the 1921 and 1928 models does not fit the M1 and M1A1 because they don't have the cutouts in the receiver to take the drum. So that's not right. That said, it wouldn't take a superly, superbly skilled gunsmith to modify a Thompson receiver to take a drum. So if that was a personal preference, hey, it's possible. We've also got the finned barrel of the earlier model Thompson fitted here, including the out, uh, the sort of, the sort of an outrigger too, but uh, the vertical grip, the, the famous gangster grip. Um, fun fact, British soldiers even today call the vertical grips on their SA-80s gangster grips, which I think is <laughs> excellent. So this is, this is kind of just a, a fun historical sidebar to what is really just a heavily customized uh, game Thompson. But, um, this game handles SMGs really nicely, so let's watch it. So this immediately makes me think of a, an infamous old um, Pecker and Koch uh, marketing department mistake where they showed one of their pistols, I think it was the USP, with cartridges in the magazine backwards because some poor sucker in the marketing department had just Put the rounds in and you know arranged it or maybe it was a photographer i don't know but that's kind of a kind of infamous in in our circles and we've ended up with cartridges in backwards and they are ejecting backwards by the bit too clearly a very a very minor thing that can be quite easily fixed and this is the trouble when you're trying to be this faithful to the reality of historical weapons or any other aspect of history stuff's going to slip through like that Now, the iron sights on the Thompson, uh, this is the highly simplified pattern of Lyman sight where it's not protected, it's just the sticky up bit. This pattern where it's the, it's a sheet of steel that has the protectors formed from it and then the sight is, is lifted out of it, pierced and notched. If anyone's thinking, why is the player not looking through the round bit? That's the sight. Why are they looking over the top? Well, they're not. That top notch is the close quarter combat sight on this pattern of Thompson sights. That's correct kind of have the player use either of them. Doesn't really matter, but this is actually a bit of correct detail. I mean, clearly what, what these guys try to do when they move theater of, of operations, as it were, is include new weapons that are native to that world, if that makes sense. And as a main rifle for Carl, we've got the RSC 1918, uh, which is looking pretty good to me, uh, except the sight and sight mount. I mean, this, the scope is the ZF4, the German Sturmgewehr scope, among other things, I think. The mount, I think, is fictional. No, it makes sense, though, that the, a main rifle for the main character would have to be equipable with a scope. To my knowledge, that was not the case for the RSC 1917 or the shorter 1918. So we've got, a, got some nice internal in terms of the feed mechanism on the RSC. So as we pull down the magazine housing, it's just a, a, a plunger to keep it in place. And you can see there that they have in fact modeled the interior of that. I'm always impressed by games that go to the length of modeling internal parts. Thanks for watching guys. Those were the guns of Sniper Elite 5, a series that I have played since the beginning and have been fortunate enough to contribute to. So very, very nice to see where it's got to in the present day. <laughs> if you'd like to help us out at the Royal Armouries, as normal, there will be a link in the description um, you can also check out our various social media outlets and our own YouTube channel as well, which um, has me on it quite a bit if you like that sort of thing. Otherwise, I'll see you again next time.